Loved ones, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Psalm 116, Psalm 116. And hey, while you're turning there, let me wish you a happy belated Canada Day. And for those of you to whom it applies, happy belated 4th of July also. Uh, I have a great love for both of those countries. I was born and raised here in Canada, spent a decade of my life in the United States. I stole one of their women to come back to Canada. Um, <laughs> I just love how uh, diverse the culture of our church is, honestly. Maybe you're here and you're an expat from a different country and you've celebrated some of your national holidays here in Canada. You've come to the Great White North to be here with us. We just want to say, as a church, how thankful we are that you're here for however long you would be here. And we pray that God is making uh, you a part of our great family here at this church. We're thankful for you today. Um, Psalm 116 is our text, again, this passage is a great one, and it's a neat one, too, because it brings us in line with someone who, for lack of a better word, is talking to himself. The psalmist is speaking a word to himself. We don't know who it is, but what they have to say, I pray, is an amazing truth for you uh, this day. Psalm 116, we'll read the passage, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. And then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and, and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return. O oh, my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Let's pray. God, we pray now in this time that you be seen to be who you truly are in greater and greater degree. Lord, what we need is you, this awesome and glorious God. God, I pray for hearts that are lit with truth today that understand who you are more and more and begin to love you more and more. What we need today is not more things. What we need today is not more, more, more of the things that the world could offer. What we need today is more of you. And so, Lord, I pray for that to be a reality for us. I pray, Lord, that your spirit be working in each and every life here, drawing us closer to you with greater and greater affection. Lord, please, please, please open hearts for you to work in this room. We pray, God, that you would be leading, and then we pray, God, that you would be glorious now. Please, Lord. Please, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the big idea for today is, is very, very, underscore very simple. Uh, it's the title of your message. It's I Love the Lord. If you come out of this room here today by saying that statement, then that's a win. That's a win from God's word as it speaks to you today that you would say, I love the Lord, I love the Lord. Or maybe even, I want to love the Lord more. I need to love the Lord more. Now, you may say to me, okay, well, what's so big about that? Why is that such an important message? Come on, substitute teacher, what's going on with that? I love the Lord. That's the point of the message today. We know that stuff already. Well, listen, I don't know if you're like me, but I need this message today. I need to understand the love I need to have for God. I need to have more of this love for God. And why is that? Well, because frankly, honestly, I love other things a lot. I find my time being spent with other things. I find my thoughts in the idle moments being spent on other things. I find my money being spent on other things. Maybe you find yourself in that place sometimes. In fact, I know you find yourself in that place a lot of times because God's word speaks to this reality that we are other thing loving people. 
We love the other things of the world. Your heart, like my heart, wanders. You run to consumable things like stuff or like money or sensuality. We run to situational things of having more popularity, more power. If I could just have a moment's peace. We run to relational things like, like love and the need for love and just that dream person, if I could find that person. And even, even in the other direction, oh, I just wish that person would go away. We run to these things. Our heart loves these things. We think about these things. We love them more than the Lord. And the Bible's very clear on what these things are called. They're called idols. An idol can be anything, and an idol can be everything. You ask yourself the question, how do I spend my money? How do I spend my time? What are my idol thoughts about? You'll find it, too. You'll find yours. Can we just be honest, other thing-loving people, and say that we need this truth. Most times, what we love is not the Lord. Most times, we love other things. Have I really, honestly, truly loved the Lord with everything I have? Well, here's the truth. For something to be loved by us, it must be first seen as lovely. Think back to the day you met your spouse, or the day you saw your children, or the day you fell in love with something. You looked at it and said, it's lovely. I love this. It's amazing. It needs to become more and more glorious in my eyes. To love God more, I need to see him as more lovely. Thomas Chalmers was, was, a, was a preacher about 150 or so years ago, and he said, he, he, he said the only way to get rid of these idols in our lives, the only way to break free from this love affair with the other things of the world is to have what he called the expulsive power of a new affection. Do you know what expulsive means? It means you kick it out. You need to have something greater and grander and more glorious. This is how you beat this stuff. This is how you walk free from sin. This is how you walk in the life that God has called you to. You need to love the Lord more. How does this work? Well, you and I walk to the car dealership, and the very first car you see is a 1985 Reliant. And that's the only car you've seen thus far. You look at that car and you say, wow, that's a great car. And I say, well, that, you think that's great? Come this way. Look at the 2016s. You say, wow. And I say, do you remember that old car? What car? This car. That's an expulsive power of a new affection working. And that's what the word of God calls us to today, to love the Lord more. You know, you can't control or beat down or remove these idols from your life until you love something more. The best way to turn from sin is to turn to a radiant Christ, to say, wow, I love, Jesus is better, because he is better. He is better. What you say to me today, well, you know what, Craig, honestly, I do love the Lord. Honestly, I do think he's great. Well, the wonderful thing about the Lord is that as much as you love him, you can love him more. As much as you think he's great, he's actually greater. You know, one thing you can't overdo in this life is thinking of the greatness of God. You can't overdo it. You can overdo thinking of yourself when you played hockey as a youth. You could think that maybe you were an MVP when you really weren't. You can overdo the thinking of how great you look in the mirror right now. You can overdo that thinking, but one thing you can never, ever, ever, ever overdo is thinking of the greatness of God because he's that much more glorious than you can even imagine. As far as you go and you're thinking of him, he's that much further, he's that much more glorious. He's that much more awesome. So listen, the prescriptive for us today is to look at the awesomeness of God. One man found out how awesome he is. He wrote this psalm. He speaks of the awesome greatness of our God. And I pray that as we see the awesome greatness of our God, it causes us to have this expulsive power to push away the lesser things in our life, to love the Lord more. That's what I want today. And interestingly, that's how he begins also. As we see these three truths, I pray you would say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, I love you. Let me give you these three truths. Here's the first one. Truth number one, what will draw greater love in your heart for the Lord is this. I can call upon him because he answers. I can call upon him because he answers. 
Verse 1 again says, I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. I can call on him because he answers. Listen, you want to love the Lord more in your life? You want to love the Lord more in your life? Then you believe in the power of prayer. You believe that prayer works. That prayer accomplishes something. That the Lord hears you when you call because it's true. You believe this. You love prayer more and you will love God more. That makes sense, right? You can't love someone until you talk to that someone. And the more you talk to this great and awesome God, the more you will love this great and awesome God. Boy, that seems so basic, doesn't it? So then why don't we pray? Why don't we pray more? If it's so true that the more I speak with this awesome God and find him in prayer, the more I will love him, then why don't I pray more? Well, I don't know about you, but I was thinking about these truths. I had the advantage of thinking about them earlier in the week, and you know, I was thinking of who I am and what are the reasons that I don't pray, and I actually came up with a few uh, lies that I have convinced myself. I realized I'm actually thinking like a four-year-old in this, actually, actually more like a two-year-old, and so I'm calling these things two-year-old lies, or, or, or otherwise known as reasons why I do not pray. Now, these are mine. They're not, they're not necessarily yours. You, you don't have to write them down, but, but this is me. Standing in front of you, moment of transparency, these are the reasons why I don't pray. They're two-year-old lies. They're lies that a two-year-old believes. Here's the first one. It's a two-year-old on a bicycle. This is bad sufficiency. What do I mean by this? Well, have you ever seen a two-year-old around a bicycle, a two-wheeled bicycle? The two-year-old looks at the bicycle, and then you look at the two-year-old, and the two-year-old says, I can do that. And you say, no, you can't, you can't do that. You need, you need help with that. That's ridiculous. And they say, quote, I do it myself. <laughs> right? Right? I do it myself. I realize in my heart, that's how I am in prayer. I can do this. I trust in my own sufficiency, in my own competency. Oh, I can figure this out with my mind. I can figure this out with my hands. I've got friends, they'll help me. You know how this one disguises itself? It often disguises itself in busyness. I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. And the more the things come in my life, the more I don't pray, when in fact the reverse should be true. The more that comes, the more I should pray. The more I'm saying to myself, I do it myself. That's me. And often, listen, often, this will disguise itself with me asking you to pray for me, but I actually haven't ever prayed about it. I, I, would you pray for me about this big situation in my life? Okay, great, yeah. But I haven't ever labored before the Lord in this. I think I can do it on my own. It's a lie, I believe, and you know what that happens when I believe that lie? I stop praying. That's the first one. Here's, here's another one. A two-year-old in, in a car ride, bad, bad thinking involved here. You ever been with a two-year-old in a car ride? If you have, bless you. A long car ride, 10 hours. Within the first half hour, the little voice comes from the back, I'm hungry. You say, hey, great, great. I got, I got a banana here for you. Got some uh, granola bar here for you. Got some uh, great vegetables and some apples. Here's some healthy food for you. Healthy food for you. And they say, no, well, how, about, how about that candy you got? I saw some gum in, in the purse there. Can I, can I get some of that? I don't want that. I want, I want the candy. And you say, I'm not going to give you candy for 10 hours, especially not in the first half hour of the car ride. I love you, and I don't want to go through that. That's craziness. And the voice comes from the back saying, no, you, oh, you're terrible to me. You're horrible to me. You must not love me because you won't give me the candy. You know what I realize? Like, I'm like this with the Lord. I want what I want. When I bring you a request, Lord, I have the designs on how you'll answer that request. And if you don't answer the request the way I want you to answer the request, then you must not love me. You must not be listening to me. You must not care about me. 
Never mind the fact that the Bible tells us over and over again that trials do come to the life of the believer and that trials are brought into the life of the believer not because God is mad at us, not because God hates us, not because of any of those things, but because God loves us and he wants to see us, our hands pulled away from the love affair that we have with this world and to run to the Lord who will satisfy. He wants to feed us with the good food. He wants to build us up in maturity and strength and endurance but I don't like his answers sometimes. When I don't get the answers I want to my instant prayers, I want these instant answers. And if I don't get them, well then I stop praying. This is, again, this is my life, maybe, maybe your life too. Here's the third one, third lie. Uh, the two-year-old in dinner time is a lie of bad memory. And by the way, no offense if you're two years old. Um, <laughs> but you guys don't think well a lot of times, okay? A two-year-old at dinner time, okay? A two-year-old comes around at dinner time and says, are we eating dinner tonight? <laughs> yes, we're eating. We, you have eaten dinner every day of your life. What makes you think you're not gonna eat dinner tonight? Oh, I'm hungry, I need to eat dinner. Look, I fed you every single day. You've never gone hungry, you've always been fed. What makes you think you won't eat tonight? I realize I treat the Lord like this too. I doubt that the Lord will be faithful. He's demonstrated his faithfulness time and time again, day after day of my life. He's walked me through the highs and the lows of this life, but I forget them. I just stop believing in them. I stop remembering all his goodness to me, and all of a sudden, this current crisis, this current trial, this current difficulty is the greatest thing I've ever faced, and I forget that God is faithful and he will lead me through this as well. You see, immaturity believes these lies. Immaturity believes, believes the lie that I can do it myself. I don't need the Lord's help. Immaturity believes the lie that God is somehow upset at me or doesn't answer the prayers. He doesn't answer the way I like, so I won't pray. Immaturity thinks that God is not faithful, but listen, maturity believes the opposite. Maturity says, no, no, I cannot, I cannot do this alone. I cannot. These difficult things, rather than meaning to crush me, they're meant to draw me to a God who loves me, who cares for me, who wants the best for me, who wants to give me himself. These difficult things are meant to grow me, not to hurt me. And what's more, this has been a faithful God. He's been a faithful God every single day of my life. Maturity says, I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The psalmist understands this great God, and what prayer does in his life is it lifts his heart to love his God even more and more. And look again, loved ones, at the text. It does not say, the text does not say, I love Bob. It doesn't say, I love Aunt Gertrude. It says, I love the Lord, the Lord the eternal, matchless God, the one with his speech has created the stars, the universe, who brings them out in its season, the one who, who causes the hydrogen to boil in the face of the sun, to give life to the plants, to feed the earth, the one who daily is surrounded by angels and endlessly cry, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. This God, this omnipotent, matchless, amazing God, hears you when you call. He inclines his ear to you. He listens to you. How many of your friends, how many of your family members, the closest person in your life can you say that of? They hear you always. They're always there for you. No, 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 when the, world, when the world says you're nothing and steps in front of you in line, ignores your opinion, doesn't listen to you, the eternal God listens to you. He looks at you. In fact, the text tells us that he inclines his ear. Two-year-olds, for all their faults, have great points too. Do you know what a two-year-old will do when they want to get your attention? It's pretty neat. They put both of their hands on your face, and then they turn your head. <laughs> and then they say, Daddy, are you listening to me? And you say, oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, we heard him. I'm listening to you. And see, the beautiful thing about our God is not just that he allows us to put hands on his face, as it were, and say, 
Daddy, are you listening to me? The beautiful thing about our God, as the text tells us, is that he is already facing you. You never have to turn his head to you. He's already inclined to you. Never a bad time. Never busy. Never anything more important than his children. I love the Lord. I want to love the Lord more. I need to love the Lord more. If that's you, then you will love prayer more. You recognize this truth today, church, that you can call upon him because he answers. And when you recognize this, the love for your God grows. And you know what happens to the things of the world? It diminishes. It diminishes. You can keep that stuff. You can keep this. I have the direct communication with the eternal God right now. You can keep that stuff. I want him. When you recognize this, love begins to grow. The psalmist gives us more fuel for the love that he wants to show us, though. What else will drive our love? I want you to see this secondly. Secondly, I can be safe. I can be safe because he delivers. The psalmist has gone through a lot. Verse 3, look down with me at the text. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. Snares encompassed. Pangs laid hold. Distress, anguish. What kind of language is this? This is hunting language. Death and Sheol have gone on the hunt for him. They've laid snares. They've got so close that they've laid their hands upon him. He's in distress. He's in anguish. Life had become like a living hell for him. There was trouble everywhere. There was pain everywhere. Some of you have been in places like this. Some of you, some of you are in places like this. But you feel hunted. You feel like there's snares all around you. The snare of your own sin may be grabbing you down. The snare of the situation, maybe at work or in your life or in your family, dragging you down. The situation of attackers coming from the outside, seeking to drag you down, and you feel as though death and Sheol are chasing you. Listen, listen, listen. The truth of God's word, though, as the psalmist understands, as he feels like this, he recognizes that he's low. He's been brought so low, low and alone, weary, desperate, in anguish and despair. But what he is realizing is that as low as he goes, the Lord's hands are always beneath him. He can never escape the grip of his God. Listen, how true is it that when you have nothing left, you find out that God is all you need? How true is it that when you realize that God is all you have, that God is all you need? The psalmist understands this. Look at verse four. Then, then, then I called on the name of the Lord. Oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Look how simple, look how short, how sweet those words are. No long speeches are needed. Oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Deliver my soul. Maybe you've prayed that before. There's nothing else. Nothing else will help me. Only you, Lord. Only you. Deliver my soul. Help, please help, please help, Lord. This is what he cries out for. And what does he find? What is his soul? What fills his soul with love? Look at verse 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. But God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple, and when I was brought low, he saved me. You know, it's very true in, in our life that, that character is, is demonstrated in the difficult times. I don't really get a sense of who you are when life is good, but I get a sense of who you are when life is hard, and I see trials in your life. If you're walking down the street hand in hand with your husband or your wife, and the kids are in single file behind you saying, yes, mother, yes, father, licking lollipops but never getting anything on their shirts or dresses. Your whole family is wearing white linen. It's beautiful. I look at you, I think you've got it all going on. Everything, look at that family, they're so great. they got it all going on. But nobody lives like that. I find out who you really are in the struggles when the kids are fighting. The clothes are messy. There's discord between you and your spouse. Life is filled with hardship 
and difficulty and struggle and toil and trial. I find out who you are in those moments. Do you know what else is true? Is that in those same moments, we find out who our God is. When life is difficult, when there's trial, when there's a sickness that doesn't end, when there's a difficulty in a relationship, when there's problems outside my home, when there's problems inside my home, I can find out the true character of who my God is. The psalmist figured this out. The psalmist understands this. When every other desire, every other crutch, every other aid has been proven too weak and there is only the Lord, he finds out who he really is. And what he is and who he is is gracious. He's gracious, the psalmist says. Gracious means to give you something that you do not deserve. I give you a gift even though you don't deserve it. It's a great and awesome gift. Who he is is gracious, and who he is is righteous. That word righteous means pure, absolutely spotless, no no stain of wrong upon him, no fault to give to him, no blame assigned to him. The Lord is pure, he is holy, he is perfect in all of his dealings. The psalmist finds out that that the Lord is gracious, that he's righteous, and then thirdly, that he's merciful. He sees this God as a merciful God. Our God is merciful, meaning he doesn't punish when we do deserve it. So so if you're keeping score, he's giving you what you don't deserve. He's declaring himself to be righteous and pure from all imperfection, and he's also withholding what you do deserve, the punishment that's rightly yours. This is who God is. And the psalmist understands this. It's made manifest before his eyes. That's who God is in difficulty. Listen, we saw this as well later on in the scriptures. When God comes incarnate and walks, and and make no mistake about this, loved ones, the greatest difficulty ever faced by any man was the Lord Jesus Christ. He suffered the most difficulty. He suffered the most hardship. He suffered the most pain and the most agony And who he is was made manifest in his trial also. As Jesus Christ lives this life in perfect obedience, pure and spotless obedience, accused by the religious elite, accused by the people, even accused by his disciples, facing difficulty and hardship and sleepless night, having nowhere to sleep. As Jesus Christ is brought before the Sanhedrin and and falsely charged with things that could not be substantiated, declared to be a liar even though he was pure truth, declared to be a blasphemer even though he was God, and then moved, marched by the Roman soldiers, beaten and mocked and spat upon the whole way until the hill and placed upon a cross and now hanging crucified on a cross. He lives this life in perfect obedience and the character of our God is on display. Not, not, listen, not in that he has endured all that he's endured, but, but listen, the reason why he endured it and the reason why he endured it is because of you. He knew that you would need it. He gave his life for you. He laid down what was his to rescue children he loved so much. The character of our God is on display and his grace, his giving of life when you do not deserve it, his withholding of the punishment of the wrath of God because of your sin that you did deserve, his declaration of the righteousness of Jesus Christ now given to you. This is what's given at the cross of Jesus Christ. This is the character of our God and this is what the psalmist starts to understand. My God is gracious. My God is righteous. My God is merciful. He saves me. He delivers me. Why? Because he loves me. And I love him right back, says the psalmist. When no one else could help, when I was locked in despair and anguish, God heard and God saved. Some of you today are in despair and anguish because of the choices that you've made. Some of you are sitting here today with with dirt on on your hands, as it were, You're looking around and you're seeing fractured relationships. You're seeing bad choices and hurt done and selfishness seen. Well, the truth is God's word lays it out is that we were all like this. We all had dirt on our hands. We are all in need of the grace and the mercy and the righteousness of God. They separate us. Apart from him, we are apart and, 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 and living under the wrath of God. But the good news for us today, the good news for us today 
is that there is more forgiveness and life in Jesus than there is sin and death in you. There is more forgiveness and life in Jesus than there is sin and death in you. And listen, 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 listen. Some of you are thinking wrongly right now and thinking, this is great, this is a good message for day one of Christian life. And you're wrong. This is not a good message for day one of Christian life. This is a truth that the psalmist has understood and he holds dear in his heart. He loves the salvation of the Lord. Even though I was a child of wrath, even though I was separated from God, alienated because of my sin, even though I needed him so badly, I cried out, no one else could help. The Lord has rescued me through the work of Jesus Christ. I am now freed. I am forgiven. I am found righteous in Jesus Christ. This, loved ones, is not a truth just for day one. It's a truth for every single day of your life in Christ. You're to walk with this diamond in your heart all the days. You wake up in the morning and you say, I can't believe that I've been saved by the grace of God. You interact with your children thinking, I can't believe I've been saved by the grace of God. You go to work, you say, I can't believe I've been saved by the grace of God. You come to church, you say, I can't believe that I've been saved by the grace of God, but glory be to God who has saved a wretch like me. I love him, I love him, I love him. That's the truth, that's the truth. And listen, loved ones, you place that diamond in your heart, you walk with that diamond in your heart, your life loves the Lord more. What are you gonna tempt me with, the things of the world? I love the truth of the gospel, that Jesus Christ came for me. He gave his life for me. He was punished for me, that I might live and the dirt comes off, and I see how much I'm loved, and I say with the psalmist, when I was brought low, he saved me. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I want to love the Lord more. I need to love the Lord more. So if that's you, the understanding of his deliverance needs to be right there in your heart. You breathe on this flame and let it grow in your life. To love the truths of the gospel. To love the power of prayer in your life. And now let me show you the third one. What else, what else will drive our love today? Verse seven. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Point number three is this, I can rest in him because he finished the work. Rest. We're back in the middle of his conversation with himself. The psalmist is talking to himself and he says, come back, soul. Come back, soul. Soul, you know where real rest is found. And he says, return, O my soul, to your rest. Rest. That sounds good this time of year, doesn't it? A break from the nine to five or the, a break from the seven to seven, whatever you work. A little less uh, taxi mom a little less scrambling in the mornings, scrambling to make lunches, scrambling to shave, scrambling to make the go train and then make the go train home, scrambling to prepare for meetings, scrambling to pick up the kids, scrambling with late night appointments. I'll be honest with you, this time of year rolls around and I'm, I'm pretty tired and I'm thankful for seasons of rest. And what the psalmist gives us right now is a perfect location for rest. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully for you. The key location, the key source of rest is one place, one person. It's the Lord. Only the Lord gives true rest, loved ones. That rest of the soul, the encouragement, the comfort, the refreshment that comes from him, and I need to be satisfied with him alone. No more distress, no more anguish. I have found the grace and the mercy of the Lord, and I rest in him. I rest in him. But sometimes, though, we get muddled up with, with rest, don't we? Sometimes we, we start to think of rest, uh, and we can falsely think of it as, as a place, rest being a place. <clears throat> this time of year, rest is if the cottage. Get, just get me to the cottage. Just get me to the beach. Get me to Florida. Just get me to the golf course. We can think sometimes of rest. And for some of you, that's like, that's the picture of rest. It's an open lake, calm waters. Some of you, rest is different. It's a thing. Rest is that cup of coffee. Oh, 
It's the book. It's the tea. Tea and coffee and book all at once. <laughs> awesome rest. Awesome rest. We can think like this, can't we? We think that sometimes rest is a, is a place, sometimes rest is a thing, but it's not true. Listen, if you think that rest can be found in these places or these things, um, then I have a harsh truth for you today that I hope you hear in love. Uh, you will never find rest, ever. If you think they're in those places, you'll never find rest. It's the reason why that one week up at the cottage, you wanted to be two weeks. It's the reason why that cup of coffee is, where'd that go? And the book comes to an end. You want more. You feel like, where'd that go so quick? It's because those things lied to you. They promised you rest when they wouldn't give you rest. In fact, if you're looking for these things, you're not going to find rest. You're going to find an idol of the soul. And if you're not careful, these may be the only things you look for. In fact, you might even find yourself praying for these things. Lord, 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 just get me to the cottage. And if you're not careful, these little rest idols or place or thing will choke out your walk and you'll wake up in Florida and you realize that you haven't thought about the Lord in a while. You'll pick your head up from the book and you pick your head up from the golf course and you'll say, huh, I'm not so hungry for the things of the Lord anymore. But listen, listen, listen. It's not that these things are bad. In fact, they're given to us by a gracious and a righteous and a merciful God and they're meant to be enjoyed. They're meant to be enjoyed from the kindness of his hands. And so I say to you today, use them. Use them. This summer, use your cottage. Use your golf clubs if you want. Use your books. Use your coffee mugs. Use your vacation. But listen, don't let them trick you into thinking that rest can be found in them. That's not the truth. In fact, as you already know, rest is not found in a place or a thing. Rest is found in the person. Rest is found in the person of the Lord. Return, O my soul, to your rest. One early church father put it this way. He said, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. That's, again, the reason why the vacation didn't seem long enough. It's the reason why the nap could have been a little bit longer. The coffee could have been a little bit bigger. The book, a little longer. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in the Lord. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 11. He said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me. Come to me, the person of the Lord. Come to me. Not the other things. Come to me. And the great thing about the Lord, coming to the Lord, you can do that anywhere. You can do that in the coffee shop. You can do that with the book. You can do that at the golf course. You can do that at the cottage to place your heart to the eternal God and run to him and find your rest. We have a, a children's book at home and it has this, this neat picture in it and I think it, it shows one of the most beautiful, in one of the most beautiful ways what it looks like to rest as a child. You remember that time when, when you were a little kid and, and you got picked up you know, I'm 38, and I honestly still remember being picked up by my dad and put against his shoulder, and I could feel the scratchiness of his beard. You know what I'm talking about? There's no feeling like that. I was safe. I was loved. I didn't have to try any harder. I didn't have to work anymore. My dad would carry me. My dad was there for me. Now, as a dad, I, I, I get to experience this now, too. I got two little daughters, and, and when they get tired, I pick them up, and, and they don't have to try any harder. They're safe. They're loved. I'll do the work for them now. Their dad is there for them now. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. You know where I'm going. The Lord is there like this for us also. He says to you, I see you sitting there today, my daughter. I see you there today, my son. You've been struggling a long time. You've been trying to do it on your own. Struggling, maybe some of you, under the weight of sin. Struggling under the weight of trial and the weight of life. I see you struggling 
so restless, so wearied, so exhausted. The Lord says, come to me and find rest for your soul. You're safe. You're loved. You don't have to try any harder. I finished the work. I'll do it all. I'm your father, and I'm here for you. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Now that's real rest. As much as the cottage could offer me, that's the rest I need. That's the rest that never goes. That's the rest that some of us need here today specifically. It's the rest we all need to hunger for. The psalmist, the psalmist understands this rest. He's tasted it. He delights in it. And it surges his heart in love to the Lord. I love the Lord. I want to love the Lord more. I need to love the Lord more. So we walk as the psalmist walks. I'm going to delight. I need to delight more in prayer and meet with my God in prayer and love him more through that. I need to delight in the truths that he has saved me. I need to rest in him. And love will grow in my life. Love will grow in your life for him. It's what we need, loved ones. It's not a bonus of Christianity. It is the life in Christ. We need to love the Lord more. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would, you would draw me closer to you. I need this. As much as I speak to my friends today, I speak to myself. I need more of you in my life. I am so easily distracted with the things of the world so easily in love with things that fall away that mean nothing that are useless in the end I need you and more of you in my life and Lord I pray please that you would teach me push away the lies that I believe in prayer and draw me close to you Lord I want to be one who hungers for you in prayer Teach to me again the truths of the gospel that when I was weakest, you saved me. Because of your great love for me, I can live today because of the worth of Christ has been exchanged in my place upon a cross 2,000 years ago. I am freed from sin. The, punish the punishment of sin is gone and I'm alive. Lord, lead me through every day in this truth. And then God, would I find my rest in you and only you. That my heart not be set apart upon the things of the world again, but Lord, trusting in you, resting in what you've done. I love the Lord, and I want to love you more. Lord, I pray that as we go now in remembrance of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on us, that we would be delighting in you. Lord, I pray that the gospel would be center in this moment of remembering the work of Christ on our behalf, his sacrifice given for us. As we hold the bread and as we hold the juice, would we remember the work that Jesus has done for us? I pray, God, that we would rest from all of our strivings in this moment and trust in you and believe in you and delight and glory in you. Lord, I pray for a, a fresh time of love. Not routine, Lord, no routine, but renewed perspective and greater love for you in this time we have. We pray that you would lead us now as we worship you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.